Okay, guys, so let's start working. And um, the exercise I gave you, we, we're we gonna try to, to at least give you an idea at the end of the class, okay? You don't need to, to give me anything. All these exercises I provide you guys, you, you, you need to bring them for the, for the quiz, okay? So the quiz is going to be, I think, in a couple of weeks because I, I want to give you time to read. And I finally got with, um, with Fordham and they're gonna help me upload the videos. I think it's gonna be a YouTube channel for you. So you're gonna be, you're gonna have the recordings available for, for you. I, I'm not sure exactly how this is gonna work, but on Friday, I have a meeting. They're gonna do that, this for us. Okay, so you're gonna have everything. Um, I think that today we are most likely going, almost gonna finish the review of statistics. So we're gonna have, we're going to start uh, econometrics technically next week. Okay, so we are in, in good shape, so don't worry. Uh, let's, let's finish and let's continue today, guys, with, uh, with the statistics. I think we did um, probability distributions, right? So that was, uh, that was the last thing we did last time. So what is a probability distribution, guys, is you need to always remember is simply the mixture of two things. One, what we call a random variable. And the probability is associated to with each of the possible outcomes. Okay. And so if you put these two things together, you have something that is called the probability distribution. Got it? And what is usual, guys, if you put uh, the x in the x axis and p of x in here, you're going to see a lot of distributions that you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know. For example, this one here. You know, another one that looks more like the F distribution, etc. Or this is a continuous distribution. Do you see that? And if we have a discrete distribution, okay, so this is going to be a continuous probability distribution. And if we have a, a discrete probability distribution, guys, you're going to see more like like a common histogram. Do you remember that? Something like that. Okay. So this is more for a discrete probability distribution. And how do we define the, if it's discrete or continuous? It depends on this random variable that can be discrete or of course can be, can be continuous. Okay. And last class, I also believe we were able to compute two measures that are really important. Two statistics that are really important in probability distributions, at least in the discrete ones, uh, are easy to compute in discrete ones because they are summations only and the continuous distributions, they are integrals. Okay, but what we said here is we can find the expected return and the expected return is simply the sum of xi times p of xi. Okay, from i equal one to n. It's simply you multiply each xi, each possible outcome with its probability and then you sum. Got it? And what we said also is that the variance, oh, we call this also, we can call this mu if it's population and X bar, if it's sample. And what we said also is that we can compute the variance and the variance is going to be simply uh, the sum of I equals one to N of, remember the variance guys is simply how dispersed the data is respect to a point that in this point here is going to be uh, the mean, correct? Distance remember is, me is measured in two ways, absolute value or a uh, square uh, power two. So that's a distance of each xi respect to the mean, a square is simply the, the distance, multiplied again by the probability that is assigned to this xi, got it? And of course, from here, we can find the standard deviation that is the positive of the square root of the variance. Make sense? So this one here again represents central tendency. And these two here represent dispersion. As usual, there is nothing new under the sun here. Okay. So now let's start talking guys about, I will focus my attention more on continuous distribution that we're going to be using 
in this class in econometrics. Uh, and I will start with, uh, of course, the, the obvious one, the normal distribution. Pretty sure you, you know the normal distribution. Pale shaped, correct? Symmetric. Symmetry implies, guys, that this part here is 50% and this part here is 50%. Asymptotic means, guys, that this part here never, to never touches or crosses the X bar. Okay, so never this, this line here never is going to cross the X, the X line here, the horizontal line. Okay, and, and what is interesting is as soon as this is a symmetric distribution, the mean the mode and the median guys, all are here. Make sense? So the, the normal distribution has some beautiful properties and that's why it's so beautiful to work with normal distribution. It's easy to work with normal distributions. You know, basically because of, of a couple of things here. So imagine I call this mu or x bar, okay? If I do one standard deviation to the right and to the left, then two standard deviations to the right and to the left, and then three standard deviations from the right and left of the of x bar. Oops. You understand what I'm doing? I'm simply moving away from, from the mean. From here to here, guys, one standard deviation, remember, what is the mass? 65% more or less of probabilities of outcomes, sorry, happening here. More or less 95, almost 96%, you know, happening here, 95, 96, in two standard deviations. And almost everything happens, guys, between three standard deviations to the left, three standard deviations to the right. So this is more or less 99% of, of probabilities. Now, of course, the, the normal distribution is beautiful because of that. It's, it's a very easy and, 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 and friendly distribution. However, guys, in finance, we have an issue with the normal distribution. So what is the probability, guys, of having a, a result that is in, in the extreme, the tails? either to the right or to the left. Almost zero, do you agree? And in real life, guys, in, in, if you do a stock market analysis or any other type of financial analysis, normally the probabilities of, of happening something in, in, the, in the tails is much higher than 0%, much higher than 0.001%, okay? So that's why the normal distribution is beautiful, but for financial applications, serious financial applications, we have some issues there, right? And we, I will talk a little more about that. Now, the normal distribution, guys, I will, I will say X is my random variable. This one here, tilde, means is distributed at, as N, this big N. We're gonna have some issues later in time, but big N in this case is going to refer to normal distribution. And then we have two parameters, mu, and sigma. Okay, so what is mu? It's basically the mean. Okay, it's also called location. This is my location parameter. And sigma, my standard deviation, that is called the dispersion parameter. 
Right? So the normal distribution is very easy to handle if you have two pieces of equation, two pieces of information, two parameters, the mean, where this is located, and sigma, how dispersed the data is. Right? And let's do a, a very simple example here. So let's assume, guys, that I have, uh, sorry, two random variables, x1 and x2. Okay, so X1 is going to be normal, uh, let's say 10, two. And, and X2 is going to be also normal, same mean, but different standard deviation. Okay, so that's what you need to do now, guys, every time that we do statistics, uh, econometrics. When we start talking about normal distributions, you need to imagine immediately where you're talking where you locate, where your distribution is going to be located and how thin is going to be your distribution. So follow me and then we can, we can draw. Obviously these two ones, these two random variables are centered at around 10, agree with me? So what is the difference between the first one and the second one? What's the difference between X1 and X2? How far apart the data points are? Yep, and, and basically what I'm saying is that, do you agree with this graph? So let me, let me hopefully graph this correctly. Uh, should, be, should be symmetric, okay? Do you agree with this graph, guys? Yes, okay. So this number here simply tells me how thin or, or fat is my distribution. Now, in terms of finance, guys, which one is more risk, represents more risk, more risky scenarios? Um, the higher the standard deviation, the higher the risk. Exactly. So basically this one here is, is riskier. Why? Because you can see, take a look to what, what is three standard deviations. Okay, let's say let's call this minus three standard deviations and X plus three standard deviations. And this one here, the, the same mean, perhaps, uh, the three standard deviations are going to be just located in here. So this implies that you can win or more, almost with 99% confidence that you're going to be around here. And you know, perhaps between eight and 12. And in this case, oh, well, sorry, we have the numbers here. So what is this? It's going to be three times six. This is going to be four. And this is going to be three times two is six, 16, right? And this one here is, um, three times six, 18 minus 10 minus eight, um, 1828. You can see, so here in this scenario, if imagine these are percentage, percentage returns. You can, you can win between four and 16%. In this one, you can lose up to 8%, but you can also make 28%. Okay? So that's the measure of risk. Risk is not only bad side of the equation, guys. Risk is also positive side of the equation. So you have both, okay? Make sense? So normal distribution, just having the, the, the parameters, two parameters allows you to identify or I understand more or less how the normal distribution is. And in terms of finance, guys, is, uh, the standard deviation is a, is a measure of risk. Of course, it's incomplete. It's not the best, but the people use this a lot. Questions? Sorry, Prof, I have a quick question. Yeah. So, I mean, generally, for higher risk investments over a longer period of time, mm -hmm. you tend to get higher rewards. So, is there a place in our um, syllabus where we start discussing that? Because we we are currently viewing risk as like a negative thing. I mean, the higher. No, 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 no. Yes, well, we are going to do that all the time. So we're mm -hmm. going to be talking all about risk every single moment. Okay. So remember, mm -hmm. this is only a, a quick review. But indeed, risk, it is not only having a bad result. You know what, some, who of you, for imagine, how many of you are, are, are more into the X1 versus the X2? So this one gives you the possibility of, of making four to 16, and this one you can lose eight, but you can make 28. That is much more than this one here. So are, is everyone in X1? So if these are two investment possibilities, which one do you select? This is personal, guys, do you agree? Remember, risk is personal. Risk is not a, a metric common for everyone. I think, yeah. Some of you is gonna, is gonna say, you I know what? I think I would be in X1. 
Yeah, you are going to the next one, so you are more risk averse. Do you agree? But there is going to be definitely some people that's going to say, you know what? Come on, why not? I will do this. Now, remember, this also depends on a bunch of um, behavioral aspects of yourself. You, you know, depends also on the amount of money you're investing. So if I'm talking about a uh, hundred thousand dollars, see, in that case, perhaps everyone is going to be here. Got it? But if I'm talking about, yeah, you know, perhaps five hundred dollars, you know, perhaps you're going to be here. Some of you are going to be here. Makes sense. So there is a lot of things that affect your risk perception, your risk aversion, guys. It's, risk aversion is individual. So every one of you is going to have an individual. And I think uh, if, for those of you that were in financial economics, we discuss a lot about this, this topic. Okay? Here, I will just mention this stuff and give you some ideas. But the mathematical treatment is, is part of an order class, guys. But I, of course, I will use the concepts in here. Okay. So risk and, and returns are going to be you know, our focus of, of attention in, in this class. That's financial economics. But I, sorry, financial econometrics in this class. Make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's continue. Uh, as I mentioned to you guys, one of the issues with the normal distribution is that it's, it's asymptotic and the tails simply represents less than 1%, or let's say 1%, right? In real life, what happens is the probability of having extreme events is higher than 1%. So what do we use? So we use, we have done uh, a small, we, we, we have another distribution that help us having this issue. And this is what is called the T-distribution. Uh, professor, just, just really yep. quick. Um, that previous drawing that you had up before, like that last set of diagrams, would it, would it be possible to get those back for just, oh, thank you. Here we go. Just give me like one minute. Yeah, no, no, take your time, guys. I, I will be talking about the, the financial intuition of everything here. The, the issue with a normal distribution, guys, is as I mentioned to you, we have 1% in the, in the tails. Okay? The probability of being in the tails is basically 0.5% in one side, 0.5% in the other side. This is not so realistic for financial applications. So we have more frequently than 0.5% of times, we, uh, we have a result that is extreme, meaning that is uh, to the left of three standard deviations or to the right of three standard deviations. Okay? So this implies that the tails, this, this, part, this part here are called tails, that the tails of the distribution should be thicker. Okay? The normal distribution is like that. We need distributions that have a, a, the tail like that, thicker. Okay? So one easy way of, of solving that, I, that is also another distribution that is very, very friendly, is the T-distribution. I will talk in a minute. Just copy for, for one minute, then we move into the T-distribution. Okay, ready? Uh, I'm ready if you're looking now. We'll yes. Perfect, John. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. So how okay. the T distribution looks like, my pleasure. The T distribution, guys, and normally what I need to do is I really need to give you some time to copy. This is like a regular class. The T distribution, guys, uh, let me draw the normal distribution first, okay? So hopefully my normal looks normal. So this is my normal distribution, let's assume. And my T distribution is going to be fatter tails. But of course, if the mass is higher here, sorry, 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 you need to be my, it's gonna be picked. So it's going to be something like. Uh, you see that? This is my T distribution. Now, the T distribution controls really nicely the, the tails. Got it? And what is interesting, guys, <clears throat> the, the, the thickness of the tails. 
depends on something that is called the degrees of freedom. Okay. We're going to use degrees of freedom. Oh, sorry, DF. We're going to use the, the concept of degrees of freedom a lot of times. Okay. And, uh, and the T, guys, the always the degrees of freedom is going to be N minus one. So what is N? Is my sample size. Well, and minus one. What is interesting, guys, is the following. If N goes to infinite, so basically the sample size is very, very, very big. What happens is the T distribution tends to the normal distribution. So for example, if you have more than 250 observations, guys, the normal distribution looks exactly the same as the T distribution. But however, if you have few observations, you know, five, 10, 15 observations, what is gonna happen, guys, is that indeed you're gonna see something like that. So the smaller n, implies fatter taste. Next time, see you. We're going to use the distribution later, but just to give you an idea of how this works or why we're going to use it, is because the T distribution guys is able to capture fatter taste, fatter taste. Okay, that represent better uh, financial realities. Now, so you need to remember this part here, please. This is this is crucial. Okay, I, I will show you this with a with a computer later. You have questions, guys, up to this point, so we can do some some exercises. Huh? Okay. Let's do some examples using the normal distribution. Now guys, remember we are in inferential statistics, do you agree? So we, we have moved from descriptive statistics, now we're moving to inferential statistics, statistics, sorry, probabilities, and then we are going to move into inferential statistics and then econometrics falls immediately, right? So we are gonna have all the tools for doing econometrics in a very way, in a very decent way. So what happens here, guys, is that we're going to have questions like this, for example. So assume, guys, that you have a sample X, okay? And let's assume that this is normally distributed and assume that this corresponds to the, to the grades on econometrics for the last 15 years. So you have more or less 2,000 observations. The average is 85 and assume that the standard deviation is, uh, let's say five, uh, let's say three. Got it? So you know that. So you have taken a, a, a lot of students, ask them the, the grades, and then you have plotted the grades and you have done some statistical tests for goodness of it. And then you realize that the, the grades on financial econometrics look like a normal with mean 85 and standard deviation. Okay, right? so that's it. So questions that are going to appear guys, and I, I, need, to, I, I need you to understand how these probabilities works because we want to use this every single time. My question is going to be, for example, guys, if you take a random guy, okay, you just walks around and then you ask him, hey, what was your grade in financial econometrics? Okay, my question is, what is the probability that the grade of this individual that you selected randomly equals 90, for example? Okay, let's do another one. This is one. Another question should be, what is the probability that the grade of a random guy walking in the street is larger or equal than, for example, 87? Okay, and then I, I, will, I will continue on. Tell me when you are done, because I want to do this couple of exercises, uh, and then I will let you work with more exercises.
Ready? Okay, guys, someone has an idea of what is P of X equal 19. Well, let's make a, a normal distribution. So I know that my mean is 85, and my question is going to be, what is the probability that X equals 90? Okay, so first of all, the normal distribution is a continuous distribution, correct? Do you remember guys, how do you compute the probability in the traditional way? Is what over what? All right, so what is the probability of uh, flipping a coin and having a head? What is that? One half. One half. How do you get to one half? One is the probability of success, and two is all the possible outcomes. Do you agree with me? Okay, so tell me, in how many ways you can get 90? One. There is no other way of, of getting 90. How many possible outcomes do you have in a normal distribution? Remember guys, a normal distribution is a continuous distribution. So this goes from minus infinite to plus infinite. So how many possible solution uh, outcomes do you have? Would it be uh, infinity? Yeah. So what is one divided by infinity? That's just infinity? Nope. Oh, was zero. One number, one divided by a huge number is zero, almost zero. Well, it's not zero, it is, it is almost zero, you agree? So that's why guys, when you work with, uh, with continuous distributions, you never find exact uh, probabilities of, ex of equalities. You need to use intervals like this one here, okay? Probability of being larger than, probability of being smaller than, probability of being larger and smaller than, etc. Make sense to you? So that's the way it works. So how do we solve this exercise, guys? Okay, so let's do the following. Uh, step one, use what is called the C number. What is C, guys? It's simply, it's simply the number minus its mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay, sorry, I'm using population here, so this should be new. just to be consistent. So this should be X minus mu over sigma is a number that is called the C number, C score. Do you remember what is the property of the C score? Have you, have you, do you remember the C? Guys, do you remember this number? Have you seen this before? I'm, I'm pretty sure if you have taken any simple statistic, you remember this. Isn't it like a Z table? Yeah, exactly. We're going to start using the C tables, but what, what, what there are two properties here, guys, that are really important. What is the expected value of C always? And what is the, the variance of C, variance or standard deviation of C? Remember that? Uh, oh, you don't see my, my screen, my Excel, right? So let me show you Excel. Take a look, guys. Do you see my Excel now? Yep. Okay, so let's create any numbers. Uh, 85, 84, 83, 78, 77, 94, 95, whatever, okay? So how many observations do we have? Three, six, seven, right? Now, what is my mean? Uh, let me in, introduce here. My, my mean or average in Excel is average. Uh, so I simply take the average of this random number. And my standard deviation, standard deviation. Let's assume that this is a population. That's why it's STD EVP. Guys, you're familiar with this, right? No? Uh, yes. Okay. So the, the, the command in, in, in Excel is STD, is STD EV dot P means population. 
dot s means sample. And remember that there is a difference that is the degrees of freedom, that um, denominator. If it's population, you divide this by n. And if it's a um, sample, you divide this by n minus one. Okay, just for consistency, I will, I will discuss this more. Once you have this stuff here, you simply block all this part here and then you get the standard deviation. Let me move this here. Okay. What I will do is, is I will create a variable C. And if you follow me guys, I will do the formula. C is going to be every single value minus its mean. So I just want to, to dollar dollar to fix it. And I will divide this by the standard deviation. And I also dollar dollar to fix it. Okay. Don't stress a lot with these guys because you're gonna have, uh, by the end of the week, you're going to have this in YouTube or, or something like that. It's gonna be available for you. So you can do this in your home later, okay? But just take a look to what happens. Okay, so what I've done is I've simply transformed my X into Z values. What is interesting guys is that if I give you Z and, and the mean and standard deviation, you can go back to X, correct? Agree with me guys? So C represents X. So it's exactly the same, simply transform. Whatever, however, what is beautiful guys is if you compute the mean and the standard deviation, so I let me write this as a number. Take a look to what happens. The mean is zero, the standard deviation is one, always. So that's why the C is beautiful, right? Because it doesn't matter what X do you have. This can be millions, this can be percentage numbers, this can be, sorry, not percentage numbers, this can be decimal numbers, it can be whatever. Compute the C, the C always has this property here. Make sense to you? Okay, so why this is beautiful? Because of the following. So always guys, this is going to be zero and this is going to be one. What is interesting guys is the following. And this applies always, okay? If X is normal, new sigma, C that is a transformation of X is going to be always normal zero comma one. You agree? Because the, the mean of C is always zero, the standard deviation of C is always one. How do we call this normal distribution? We call this normal distribution, the standard normal distribution. Stand So guys, step number one basically is transform your X into Z, right? So how do we do that? Well, I have my P. What I will do is I will do X minus mu over sigma. And what I do in one side, I need to do in the other side. It's going to be 87 minus, my mean is 85 divided by a sudden deviation of three. All right, so this is equal to probability of C larger or equal than calculator. Where's my calculator? So it's two divided by three, correct? 0 0.67. Guys, questions for, for this first part. Step one, you transform your X on Z. Now, you step two. Of course, 
as soon as you, you get familiar with this procedure, you don't need to do this one here, but I suggest you guys, and I will ask you in the quizzes graph, okay? So I want you to graph because I need to be sure that you understand what you're doing. So my step two is going to be graph. Okay, so I will do, uh, this is zero, correct? That represents in terms of C, this is zero in terms of X, this is 85. Okay, so we're talking about the same numbers transform. Now, what I'm saying is I'm looking for this, this value, 0 0.67. 0 0.67 is going to be around here. Okay, and what I'm looking, just take a look guys to greater or equal than. So this implies that I will be looking for this part here. Agree with me? Okay, so now how do I find this probability? Well, normally you use the tables, but if we don't have tables guys, we can do Excel. So. Let me show you Excel. So one minute to copy and then we, we do Excel. Give me one second, please. Uh, oh, you don't see Excel. Sorry, Brad. So let me show you Excel again. So what I have here, this is my, my C larger than, do you agree? So what I have is C larger or equal than, than 0 0.67. So this one here is, is known as a critical value. Got it? In order to find the probabilities associated to that, what we do is we do, let me do F2. And let me, give me one second, let me enlarge this one. Take a look. So what we do is the normal distribution, we enter the critical value. This is zero means the standard deviation, sorry, that the mean of the C is zero. The standard deviation is one. And this one is cumulative. I will explain you why I'm using cumulative. Because that's the way that the tables are presented on them. Make sense to you guys? So what is this one here? I have 0 0.748 or nine. So remember this number, 0 0.749. So what is that? So if we go to our, our graph, the 0 0.749 is this probability. So the probability, so let, let me perhaps draw this in red. So all this part here, guys, equals 0 0.749. All this part here, from the minus infinite up to this point, is 0 0.749. Now, how do I find in this, this region here? This is my step three. So how do I find this region here? Remember, the all is equal to one, correct? It's a probability. So this should be equal to one minus 0 0.749. Agree with me? 
And basically your probability, so the probability of C larger or equal than 0 0.67, that is exactly the same as the probability of X larger or equal than 87, should be equal to uh, more or less 0 0.251. 25%. Um, professor, can you go back very quickly to Excel page to explain the function that you use to get a normal distribution, the yep. norm that this B101 and one, yep. which- yep. Yeah. Give me one second, I, I will go back. Can you copy this and then I go back to the, to the Excel? Ready? Okay, guys, so let's go back to Excel. So remember the input that I need from here is simply this 0 0.67, the critical value. So I go to my Excel, and then I see, see, well, I need this number here, and uh, the command is norm.dist. What is B1 is a 0 0.67. What is my, my standard deviation? Remember, it's a C, so the, sorry, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one, correct? And one, I'm using cumulative because I want to go from minus infinity, minus infinite up to this point. You're gonna do exercises now, guys. I, I will give you exercises to practice. Make sense to you? Okay, yep, so basically you. guys, if you, if you get some guy walking around and if you know that X, so the, 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 the probability distribution is like a normal with mean 85 and standard deviation three, for you it's going to be very simple to find probabilities, you agree? So that's why when you do financial analysis, guys, what you need to do first is try to get data. With the data, you build a distribution and lucky you if you get a normal distribution, but you can get many other different distributions or can be a non-parametric, you can start making questions about probabilities. You know, what, what is the probability of getting a 2% a, a return, for example? Oh, it's going to be 0 0.01, okay? With, uh, with, I don't know, with Alcoa. But perhaps with Tesla, the probability of making 2% is, is around 3% or 4%. Make sense? And how do you do that? You do this exactly this procedure. Okay, now let's go and let's be sure that you understand. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, let's do number three. You tell me guys, what is the probability that X is going to be smaller than 82? Okay. Let's do another one. What is the probability uh, that X is going to be between 82 and 89, for example? Okay, go ahead guys, three minutes to do this.
I will bring water, guys. I come in one minute. Okay, guys, solved? More or less? You're gonna be a machine doing this stuff, guys. It's so, it's so simple once you get it, you wanna see. Okay, so let's do that, the technique. Step one, what is the step one? Oops. As usual, just remember the algorithm. Step one is what? Transform this one into Cs, right? So this is going to be P of, I will write this directly, see? It's smaller than, if I do to the left, I need to do in the right, so 85 divided by three. So this is basically the probability of C is smaller than minus one, correct? Okay, so I will do the, the same here. If I do to the left, I need to do to the right. So it's going to be 82 minus 85 divided by three. 89 minus 85 divided by three. So this is going to be equal to P. Do you help me, please? Can you tell me these values? So this is minus one, like this. And this one here is what, four, four over three. 1.3 repeating. Yeah, 1.33, okay. So that's what we want. So let's go now to, to Excel just to get these values. So let me, let me draw first my step two. So my step two is to graph, right? Until we are familiar with these ones here, it's better to graph. Okay, so I have my graphs. I have my graph, okay? Now, uh, I will just work with a, with a C, so this is zero. This is zero. I need to look for my critical point, minus one. So let's say minus one. Which region I'm looking for, guys? To the left or to the right? To the left. To the left. So this is my, my area of interest. Now, what happens here, I will be between minus one and 1.33, perhaps here. So what should I color? In the middle. In the middle. So I, I should color all this part here. You agree? Okay, so now let's go to Excel.
And then what I will do is I will do, okay, so you take notes, guys. What happens when this is minus one? So when it's minus one, the probability is 15.866, correct? Now, what happens when it is, uh, well, minus one, we have the other one, and 1.33, the probability, the cumulative probability up to 1.33 is going to be 0 0.90824. Agree. So when is minus one equals 0 0.515866, when it is 1.33 equals 0 0.90824. Okay, so let's go into in here. And remember guys, that the probabilities always go from the left to the right, up to the point that you want to, to stop. So basically my probability from minus infinite up to this point equals what? 0 0.15866. Do I agree? Do I need to do something here? Nothing, it's already the answer. So my answer is going to be the probability of X, sorry, of C is smaller than minus one. That is exactly the same as the probability of X is smaller than 82 is going to be equal to 0 0.58. Six, six. So 16 percent. Professor, I just have a quick question. Please go ahead. Um, is there any difference, like if it said the probability of X is less than or equal to 82, would you have to do it any differently or would it be the same thing? No, yes. You know what, this is a, a great question. So let me make a note here. The probability of X imagine is smaller than 82 versus the probability of X is smaller or equal than 82. When you have a continuous distribution, they're equivalent. Okay, why, why is that? Tell me guys, what is the, the number that is smaller than 82? The closest number is smaller than 82, the zero point or 82. What is the closest number in a continuous distribution? 0 0.81999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
1-5-8-6-6, and then your answer, <clears throat> I don't know what is this, calculator, 0.90, <clears throat> A24 minus 0.15866. So this is going to be equal to 0 0.74. So your answer is going to be a probability of, sorry, this is not X, this is C. We need to be, we need to talk properly, guys. Okay. This is not X, this is C. So the probability of C between minus one and 1.33, that is exactly the same as a, as a question that we're looking for, 82x89 <clears throat> is exactly, is equal to 74.95. Questions? Uh, professor, I have a quick question. Um, so, you know the 0 0.90824? Um, doesn't that represent the probability of Z being less than 1.33 and not being less or than or equal to 1.33? No, that was that explanation I was doing here, guys. The difference between less than or less or equal in continuous probability distribution is, is nothing. So they are equivalent. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Okay, so if you if you are talking about discrete, like the binomial geometric, hypergeometric, yeah, in that case, it, it is different. And it sometimes can be completely different, guys. Got it? But when we are talking about continuous distribution, it's exactly the same. We, we, don't, we don't make a distinction between smaller or smaller or equal, or greater or greater or equal. Make sense to everyone? Yep, one minute to copy, guys, and then we move. Okay, so we can move. Excellent. So let's let's go, guys, to, to something more. Okay, so now you understand how probabilities works when you have a population, right? Because I was assuming X is a population. Now, guys, in real life, you don't have populations. Remember, what you do is you have samples of a population. Remember, that's the statistics. Because, guys, if you have the population, there is no statistics anymore because you know ex that what is exact mean, what is exact, the exact standard deviation. So you are done. You, you don't have a study. You don't even use probabilities. You simply use what you have in front of you. That's it. Got it? However, guys, what in real life happens is, okay, so imagine we have the population, okay? So this is my population. And, and the only way you can get access to the population, guys, is with, with a survey. Okay, and the service here in USA are, are each 10 years and not all the questions that are interesting for you are, are asked here. But what we normally do is we do a sample. So let's assume guys that I take a sample, let's call this sample one. And I will say the sample size is n. Okay, so this is my sample. Perhaps one of you is gonna take another sample. And the only condition that I will get is that sample size is always the same size. And perhaps another guy has part of my, of my sample goes here and I have the same sample size. And then you can do as many samples as, as, as you want. Of course, in real life, you do only one maximum. Okay, so, you, but you can create technically as many sample sizes as you want. Agree with me? Now, please follow me for, for a minute. Follow, follow my ideas for a minute. Assume guys that I take sample one. And assume, guys, that I compute from this sample one, it's mean. You can do that? Yeah, right? If you have 30 observations, you can compute the mean, you can compute the standard deviation, you can compute whatever you want with these numbers, correct? Now, can you do the same with sample two? Can you compute the sample, uh, sorry, the, the mean of sample two? Yeah. Then if you have K samples, all of them sample size n. So remember the condition here is that sample size is always the same. I can compute also the mean, right? Now, 
Can I more or less understand what is the probability of this one here? Yes, I can, I can more or less estimate the probability of this one here. What is the probability of having this one here? I can compute what is the probability of having this one here. And can I also compute what is the probability of having the mean this one here? So how do we call this? The combination of a random variable with a probability is called what? Probability distribution, do you agree? Make sense? But in this case, guys, the, the probability distribution has a special name because we're talking about samples. So that's why it's called sample probability distribution or probability distribution of samples. Probability distributions of sample means. And you understand that, right? It's a probability distribution because I have random variable probabilities. And sample means, because you know what, what I'm doing is I'm taking the, the, the mean of, of the samples. Okay? And we're going to be using all the time this part here. Now, properties. One, if the population guys, if X, is normally distributed mu sigma. Okay, so attention, it's normally distributed already. The sample, the, the sample mean is also going to be normally distributed. And the parameters, guys, are going to be mu sigma square root of n. How do we call, you, you have seen pretty sure, how do we call this? This one here is called a standard deviation. Everyone knows that, correct? How do we call this part here? What is the, the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, square root of the sample size? How do we call it? Do you remember? A standard error. And remember, guys, when, when you have done a study econometrics in the past, we always talk about the standard error. Why do we talk about the standard error? Well, because we're working with samples. And what are we trying to compute in econometrics? Sample, uh, sorry, means, expected values. That's what we do. Of course, there is, there is one part of the class in which we are going to estimate pro, um, volatilities. But in general, we do conditional means. Got it? And if you remember in, in your printouts of Excel, R, or any other program that you have used in econometrics, we always have the standard error. Make sense? Now, property number one, and this property is crucial, guys. If X, if we know that, you know, I don't know how, we have done a, a huge survey, and we know that from the survey that indeed my population is normally distributed with these parameters, my sample mean, I, I, it doesn't matter what sample mean, is going to be also normally distributed. Right? If it's normal, this one here is going to be normal by construction. You don't need to think, you don't need to think anymore. Now, let's go to, to the more complex case. What happens, guys, if X is distributed as whatever, okay, and, and can have parameters, this one's here, and they can have another parameters. Can be whatever distribution, not even a, a well-known distribution. Can be F, I, squared, gamma, Poisson, whatever you can imagine. What can we say about the distribution of the sample mean? So remember, there are two pieces, always, distribution and parameters. So if you don't know what is the distribution, so what, is the, what happens with X bar? What is the distribution of X bar? We have no clue. What are the parameters? We have no clue. Got it? So this is the worst case scenario. You don't know the, the distribution of the population. You have no clue about the distribution of the sample, of the sample mean. However, I will copy the same. If we don't know the distribution of the population and it can have mu, sigma, whatever, okay? They can have more parameters because <clears throat> there are some distribution guys that you have a different number of parameters. <clears throat> However, if 
and only if n, the sample size, is large, I can argue that, that the sample mean is going to be normal mu sigma square root of n. Okay, so now what is n large? Okay, I don't know why the literature guys use the famous 30. Okay, but in real life, guys, if you have more than 150, 200, you're more, you're, you, are, you are safer. How do we call this one here? Do you remember? This is the famous CLT, Central Limit Theorem. So the central limit theorem tells you the following guys. It doesn't matter what the distribution of the population is. If your sample size is large enough, the sample mean is always going to be normally distributed with parameters mu sigma square of n. You see the power of, of this central limit theorem guys? Basically it means the following. If you are working with a very small sample size, you're gonna have issues. What do you do? Simply increase the sample size. Okay? If, you, if, you can, if you can get 100 observations, you're more, more than enough, you're safe enough to, to apply to the central limit theory. Got it? So now we are gonna see how this applies because that, that's crucial. And in econometrics, guys, we always apply central limit theorem. Uh, in financial econometrics, we don't even mention it. Why? Why in financial econometrics we don't mention central limit theorem, guys? We of course apply it, but why don't we mention every single time? It's not like macro guys or micro guys. Why are we always talking about cent we are not talking about central limit theorem in financial econometrics? Why do you think? Is it because there are always like so many more values than you need? That's it. The sample size is big. They agree. And if the sample size is large, guys, you don't care about the distribution of the population. You simply say, you know what? I'm satisfying central limit theorem. I'm sure that X bar follows a normal distribution with these parameters. Make sense? Uh, professor, quick question. Um, I think I missed this, but um, what does the dot represent again? Oh, that represents that we have no clue about the probability distribution. So remember here, I said it's normal. Yeah. The population is normal here. The population is whatever. I have no clue. Can be gamma Poisson, can be whatever distribution. This means I have no idea of the distribution. Okay, so it's like unknown. Yeah, unknown, or you know the probability distribution. Okay, it can be unknown, but it's not normal. So this dot means basically not normal. Uh, that, that's a better definition. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. So these three rules are crucial, guys. Now, if you're in case one or case three, your life is solved. The issue we are not going to cover more because this, this is a, at least five classes to understand this part here. I'm not covering this part here, okay? Just take a look to any statistic book and then, then you can more or less track how, we, how you can solve your life when you have this, this scenario here. But real life examples, guys, and, and this is one of the questions that I, I really enjoy asking the people that comes to for a job application is that, this explain me the central limit theorem. Why, why is it so crucial, right? Because your life makes, once you know the central limit theorem guys, your life goes back to, to these type of questions. You're gonna see in a minute, okay? As soon as you know that this is normal distribution, you can use the same techniques that we have here. You can do probabilities like we have here. We can use statistics and econometrics in a, in a most you know, secure way. Right? You wanna, you're gonna understand the econometric side later. But let's focus now on, on the statistics. Okay, can, can I move? Okay, so let's do one example. <clears throat> so let's do one example. Let's assume, just the, the easy case, that X is normal like we did. Um, 85, we said, and three, right? This is my previous example. Let's assume that I know this. I, perhaps it was a huge survey at forum of all my students over the last 15 years. And then we can assume that this is a population, this is very big, okay? 
Assume that your sample size, you take a sample size of nine, nine students, randomly selected. You select nine students that are just walking in, in the campus. Not now because of coronavirus, but you can pick them, nine. My question is going to be the following. What is the probability, and, and then you compute, what is, before computing the mean, what is the probability, guys, of the, of the sample grades, of the mean of the grades, is, for example, of this group of students is going to be larger than 89. Okay. Do you understand the, the, the example I'm, I'm working here? This one here is completely different, guys, than the previous one in which I used the, the complete population. So when we were talking about these examples here, I was talking about the population. Okay. In this case, no. In this case, what I'm talking is I'm talking about a small sample. Well, in my example, it's only, only nine guys. So and my question is, what is the probability that the average grade of these nine guys is larger than 89, knowing that the population is distributed as a normal 85,3. Okay? Do you understand the question? Because the question is crucial, and understanding the concept is crucial. Make sense to you? Okay, so how do we solve that? So before going to step one, step two, step three, we need to remember here step zero. What is step zero, guys, is identify the distribution and parameters of the, of the sample mean. So first of all, I will type this. If X is normal 85,3, X bar is what? Tell me guys. X bar is what? Which case is this one here? Case one, two, or three? One. One. So if this is normal guys, by, by construction, this one is also going to be normal. Okay. And what are going to be the parameters? Well, the same, 85, but this one here is going to be three divided by the square root of N. So, well, this, this one here is going to be equal to three. Uh, this is going to be equal to one. All this is going to be equal to one. Make sense? Once you know this one here, then you go to the normal step one. So what is your normal step one? It's okay, I will transform this one here using the, the, the C technique. And the C technique is the same. So it's going to be P of C. I will transform this one up, sorry. Larger or, is larger or equal than 89 minus 85 divided by the standard error divided by one. Be careful here that I'm using one now. I'm not using the standard deviation. I'm using one. That is the standard error. So why I'm using the standard error? Because I'm acknowledging that I have a sample size. I, I have a sample. I'm not using the population. So this one here is going to be simply the, pro the probability of C larger or equal than four. Correct? So probability, so no probability. Step two. I have my, my normal distribution. I have my zero here. And, and four guys is very far away here, is, is here. Do you agree? So which region do I want? The, the right or to the left of four? To the right. To the right. So basically this is small piece here. Now, if you go to, to Excel, guys, I can tell you that, because remember, we said the three standard deviations are already 99%. So basically from zero to three, it's already 99%. Do you agree? So four is going to be basically, this part here is going to be one minus 0 0.9999, something like that, do you agree? Yes or not? If you don't believe me, let's go to Excel. Let's go to Excel. And then what we do is we simply change this number. It's 1.33. Let's change it to four. Do you see that? Do you see Excel, guys, or, or not? Yes, I yes. see it. So basically, from minus infinity to four, it's almost one, 0 0.9997. So what is left, one minus this number is 0 0.0000. 
Okay, so the probability is almost almost zero. So nine 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 seven. If you want to be strict, so your step three is going to be that the probability of that this mean is larger or equal than eighty nine. That is the same as the probability of C larger or equal than four is zero point zero 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 three. Very very small. One minute to copy, guys, and we need to move. Questions, guys, make sense? Okay, so let me let me propose you another example. Uh, what was I going to tell you? Oh yeah, example two. So I continue the, the same, okay? I know that X, but in this case, I have no idea what is the distribution. I, I know that the mean is 85, the standard deviation is also three, but this can be another parameters. And I have a sample size of nine, and I ask you, what is the probability of X between 87 or 86 or 85 and 87? What do you mean, guys? <clears throat> Some answers.
Okay, guys, why, why are you taking so long? How can we solve this if we don't, uh, <laughs> if we don't know our distribution and the sample size is only nine? Good, that, that's the point. You cannot solve it. Okay, guys, you cannot solve it because remember what I'm telling to you guys is S0. I will copy this. I have no idea what is this. This distribution can be whatever. I know that N is small. So this implies that I have no clue about my sample mean. So with, with the things that we have learned, cannot solve it. Make sense to you guys? So that's crucial guys, please remember. If you don't know the distribution and your sample size is very small, you're done. Okay, no, sorry, I'm, I'm exaggerating. You're not done. So you need to have a more advanced statistic tools. Got it? But with the, with the tools that are common to everyone and everyone uses, you are, you are done. You cannot do anything. So what is the solution? What is the solution, guys? Of course, if you can, what, what do you do to solve this issue? If you can get more observations. That's it. Increase your sample size. Make sense? If you increase your sample size, what you are doing is you are creating a, an N that is large enough that the central limit theorem is going to apply. And if the central limit theorem applies, you can know that X bar is going to be normal also. Got it? So that's what I'm telling to you now. If X bar is whatever, But my sample size now is imagine 100. Okay. Can you please compute what is the probability of being between 85? Uh, it's not X, this is X1. And 86. Can you compute that? Now you can. But tell me why. Okay. So remember, you need to tell me why. and. Uh, that's crucial for me that you understand why you are doing something. Why you cannot solve because N is small, you cannot apply, cannot call central limit theorem. That's it. I, I want you to tell me that. Okay. Go ahead, guys. Solve now this example.
Ready, guys? Okay, step zero. Don't forget the step zero when you have the sample mean. Okay, in the test, do it. And in real life, this is going to be extremely helpful for you guys. So, step zero is I have no idea of what the population is, but I can compute, of course, always uh, the parameters. And because n equals 100, that is a large number. So, I can call the central limit theorem. And I can see, I can say that x bar. Is going to be normal 85,3 divided by this one here. Do you agree with me? Guys, you agree with me? Yes. So this number here is going to be what? 3 divided by 10, 0 0.3. And now I do my step. Once I know that this is normal, guys, I'm in the in the previous world. You see, you, I know how to solve with normal distribution. That, that's easy. So now my question is, uh, what is my probability of X bar between 85 and 86? Okay, so I do my Z. This is 85 minus 85 divided by 0 0.3. This is C, 86 minus 85 divided by 0 0.3. So this is equal what, this is zero. And uh, one divided by 0 0.3, 3 point what, something? 3 point something? 3.333. Yeah, 3.33. And then what I have here is, I have my zero here, and I'm interested about 3.33 is around here. Agree, so what? area I'm looking for, I'm looking for this part here. Everyone is with me. Yep. We go to Excel. Let me show you Excel. Uh, and I look for zero point, uh, sorry, 3.33. Instead of four now it's 3.33. Yeah, it's, it's very high. 99.57. So I know that from minus infinite to this point here, 0 0.99957, I think, correct? So how do I find this part here? Oh, well, I, I know from here to here is what? Well, from minus infinite to zero equals what? 0.5. Yeah, 0 0.5. So basically the difference between these two guys is going to be 0 0.49957. Agree? So finally, the probability of C between 0 and 3.33, that is exactly the same as the probability of X between 85, the, not X, X bar between 85 and 86 is going to be equal to almost 50%. Make sense to everyone? Okay, guys, so you need to really manage central limit theorem, law of large numbers, okay? And you need to understand these concepts because they are crucial. I, I will talk with them, I will talk about them all the time in, in econometrics. I'm pretty sure you have heard about them, but hopefully now it makes sense to you, okay? Okay, so at least let me do a very brief introduction. Okay, one minute to copy. Let me do a very brief introduction now, guys, in, in, in technical, this is probabilities, okay? And of course, we're gonna see more probability distributions later, but if you get the idea here, you're gonna get the idea later. Uh, we're going to talk about now uh, inferential statistics. So we're moving towards econometrics finally. So what is inferential statistics, guys, is the following, is if you know, if you take a sample, 
you compute the sample mean. Based on this sample mean and based on probabilities, what is basically the population representation of this? What is the population mean? Got it? So this is basically a inferential statistics. Make sense? So let me open another one. So remember guys that the first day of class, I told you, okay, so this is my population. You have your sample. You do the descriptive statistics of this sample. Then you do here some probabilities. So we have done up to here. And then once you know this stuff, you are going to start doing inferential statistics. So we are starting guys inferential statistics. Okay. So what do we do here? If I know, for example, what is my, my sample mean? What can I tell you? What can I know about my population mean, for example? If I know my sample standard deviation or my sample variance, what can I say about the population variance? If I know my population standard deviation, sample standard deviation, what can I say about, oopsie, my population standard deviation? Got it? So that's all, that's inferential statistics. Got it? And, and of course, the one, one, one way of, of analyzing this one here is, well, let's do point estimates. So this means the following. If you know X bar, you can argue that X bar represents your population. Agree with me or not? Or if you know S squared, you can argue that S squared represents your population variance. Now, how confident do you feel about this stuff? How confident do you feel, guys, at taking a sample of size 100? You can be sure that this represent that this value is exactly the same as the population mean that is uh, 1 million people. How, how do you feel about that? Not great. Not great, right? Really? It's a huge disparity. Yeah, you know what can happen, guys? So these are the point estimates. What can happen in, in real life? So imagine, OK, so I don't know, you, you, you talked with God. And God told you, hey, you know what? This is a population mean. You don't know it, okay? What can happen, guys, is you can take a sample and then you, you can be very, very lucky. And indeed, your sample mean is exactly the same as the population mean. You can be very lucky, do you agree with me? But also you can be very unlucky and perhaps your, your sample mean is, is around here. Or you can be, you know, kind of close, you can be here. Make sense to you? So that's the, the, the problem with point estimates, guys. That the probability of making an error with this estimate is so high that your confidence is zero. Do you agree? Make sense to you or not? Okay, so let me give you one example. And then with this, we we'll stop and then next class we we'll do this. Imagine, guys, that you are going to work for me, okay? And I give you one, a couple of years of data about sales. And I tell you guys, you're gonna manage my business for a year, okay? And after a year, I will evaluate you and then I will decide to continue hiring you for another year or, or not, depending on what you tell me. So imagine that the average sales during the last five years say, was equal to $1 million. So tell me guys, what is your, your estimate for next year? And the condition is going to be the following. If you give me the exact number, you're going to stay with me. Otherwise, you're, you're out. So you know that the, the average during the last five years is $1 million sales. What is your forecast for the next year? Why don't you tell me $1 million? It's my sample mean. It's my average. Why? Why, why, why do you do that? Because you don't feel confident, do you agree? Because if you give me $1 million and then I arrive to December 31st, 2021, and then I see that it was 999.99.99, it's not 1 million, you're out. You're with me? So how do you protect yourselves?
Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing you. Tell me what's your, your, your estimate for sales next year. Supposedly you could run a regression. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yes, I agree. But give me a number at this point. Yes, completely agree with you. But guys, what you're gonna do in order to protect yourselves is simply giving me a range, do you agree? Some of you are gonna say, yeah, you know what? I, I think that yeah, perhaps we can, of course, more analysis is going to be involved from your side, but you can tell me, oh, it's gonna be between 900 and 1.1 million dollars. Makes sense to you? It makes perfect sense. So you're protecting yourselves. And of course, I will show you how to create this type of, of confidence intervals. They are called, well, in this case are intervals. Now, what if one of you guys told me the following? What is that best way of protecting you? You are 100% sure that what you tell me is going to be realized in the future. It's one way, right or not? How you can be 100% sure of that what you tell me is exactly what's going to happen in the future? What? Come on, guys, very simple. I, you tell me, you know what? Next year, I will make between minus infinite, plus infinite. How sure you are that the, the sales next year are going to be between minus infinite and plus infinite? 100%. Do you agree with me or not? However, what happens, guys, in real life, if you tell me that, I fire you right now. <laughs> because it's stupid. Make sense to you? Come on, of course, you're going to be 100% sure. But that doesn't make sense in business. So you are fired right now. Okay? And that's exactly what we're going to try to manage now. Is you are going to be kind of, you're going to have this kind of confidence that you're going to feel okay, but you're not going to be 100% sure. Of course, because we are, in, we are living in a world that is kind of crazy. Okay, guys, so that's what we're going to cover next week. Um, please study this stuff. The, the date of the first quiz, it is unknown because I haven't finished. So next year, next Next week, I must finish yes or yes, because we need to enter into econometrics. We are going to run. Don't worry about that. OK, guys. So if you don't have more questions or questions, please uh, email me. I, I normally answer. OK, guys. So have a good night. And I need to prepare for our next class. See you later, guys. Take care. Thanks, Professor. Thank Bye. You. My pleasure, guys. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.